All right, good afternoon, and welcome to Beer Engineering 101. This talk is being made possible today through the Lifetime Learning Program in partnership with the Alumni Association. My name is Jennifer Hubner, and I'm a development researcher in the Office of Development and Public Affairs here at UVA. And on behalf of the University of Virginia, I'd like to extend a warm Wahoo kind of welcome for Reunions Weekend 2012. We are so thrilled to have you here on grounds at home at your alma mater. Mark Thompson is the founder and master brewer of Star Hill Brewing Company. He has a Master's of Science in Biology from Portland State University and has cultivated his craft in Portland, Denver, and now Charlottesville. His beer has won numerous awards, including 2005 Gold at the Great American Beer Festival for his Irish Dry Stout. He has several publications, most recently Dry Stout Recipe and The New Brewer. Mark shares his expertise and talents by presenting for national conventions and symposiums, as well as the University of Virginia's short course on beer tasting. He's been behind the judges' table at many beer festivals as well. Having graduated from Western Albemarle High School, he has a love of Charlottesville and an appreciation for Thomas Jefferson's revolutionary visions. Luckily for us, Mark has brought his knowledge in great beer making back to our area and is also an adjunct at EVA. With that, I'm pleased to turn the podium over to Mr. Mark Thompson. Thank you very much for the uh, kind words. Um, so hopefully I don't blow this microphone up. Well, welcome you guys. I'm very uh, pleased to uh, see so many smiling faces and uh, definitely some uh, beer people that have walked in as I first met. And there's nothing better than, uh, you know, than beer. And hopefully I will uh, entertain you a little bit today, educate you a little bit today. And as I started thinking about you know, what to say and how to kind of present to the, to the crowd today and thinking that you guys were all alum, uh, I, I had a memory. My, my, my first memory, I, I was born and raised here in Charlottesville, born at the Martha Jefferson Hospital, grew up in Charlottesville, went to Western Albemarle High School. But my first real memory of, uh, I was probably 15-ish, 14, 15, of, of, of UVA was I was at a fast food restaurant in, uh, in, in uh, Barracks Road. And I'm standing there, and there are all these people just covered in mud, soaked everywhere. And I asked myself, my friend, like, you know, what's going on? Why are all these people covered in mud? And he said, well, it's Easter's weekend, of course, and they have this thing called the Mad Bowl, and they just get all uh, crazed and, and jumping in mud. Well, you know, of course, being a young kid at that time, well, I've got to go check out this Easter's weekend thing. So the following year, some friends and I like, kind of snuck down to Rugby Road, and we're walking around, and eyes just wide as they could be, and, and I'm telling myself, you know, if this is what college is all about, you can count me in, because this looks like a good time to me. I want to be part of this, you know, and, and not that long after, the uh, Playboy publishes its top 10 party schools, and at the end, there's a little asterisk that says, uh, sorry, UVA, we don't rank professionals, so that was kind of my founding memory of Charlottesville and my founding memory of the university, and, you know, but within, with all jokes aside, with, within that mud crusted cake and, and haze if you will there's there's really a unifying theme and a unifying lesson that is beer and beer is one of the few things in in in, in this life that crosses all races all religions all colors and creeds every culture on this planet celebrates their rite of passage around a fermented cereal grain beverage that we call beer and so when i started star hill brewing company uh you know we our mission has always been the gift of great beer because we truly believe in that mission that beer is where we celebrate our, our, our rites of passage if, if we uh if our team, if you use a sports analogy, if our team wins the game, we might have one beer. If our team loses the game, we have two beers. So it cuts across all, uh, all, 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 all sides of things. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk you guys through kind of like a little bit of my background, a little bit of the background of uh, Star Hill, um, a little background about beer itself. And we're going to go through uh, just a little bit of uh, whoo, all things beer in general. So that's our cover slide. A little background on me, as I mentioned, 1965, born at the Martha Jefferson High School. Uh, Martha Jefferson Hospital, graduated from West, <laughs> I'm a little nervous here people, like ease up on me, right? It's a, it's a little too early, I haven't had any beers yet today, so. <laughs> Grad graduated from Western Albemarle High School in 1984, got my Bachelor's of Science, welcome you guys. Uh, bachelor's of Science degree, Biology from James Madison University, and then I moved out uh, to Portland, Oregon. So in the 1992 blog is where, for me, things really got interested. Uh, I was working on my master's degree in uh, Portland State University, uh, and I, a friend of mine, we were playing poker one night, and a friend of mine came over, and he had this case of kind of mislabeled bottles of beer, and we all said, well, where'd you get that? Well, there's a local microbrewer that just had opened up in Portland in 1992, and they paid you minimum wage and a free case of beer every day, and you know, at age 22, I thought that might be the best job you could ever have, uh, getting you paid in proverbial free beer. So I took a part-time job at, at a microbrewery called Norwester Brewing Company in Portland, Oregon, and really uh, 
the heavens opened up, all the science that I'd studied, all the chemistry and, and microbiology and, and classes that I'd taken, you know, really made sense to me. And uh, I got into the game uh, in the, at the right place at the right time in 1992 when microbrew and a craft brew was really coming out of the soup for the first time in, in, in the uh, Pacific Northwest. So after a Nor'wester in 1995, moved to Denver, Colorado, where I started a Mile High Brewing Company. It's uh, neither of the first two brews are still around, but so I started a brewery in Denver, Colorado in 1995. Had the opportunity to come back uh, to my hometown of Charlottesville in uh, 1999, where I founded Star Hill. At the time, it was Star Hill Restaurant Brewery and Music Hall. We uh, had a was right on Main Street in what is the Star Hill neighborhood of Charlottesville. We took over for, for, from uh, Bach and Paul Summers, the grandchildren of William Faulkner, the famous author. They opened up the very first brew pub here in Charlottesville, Blue Ridge Brewing Company, uh, right there on West Main Street. Ran it for about 12 to 13 years and um, very successful uh, uh, brew pub operation that we took over in 1999 from them and then changed the name to uh, Star Hill, which is the neighborhood of downtown Charlottesville. Uh, so it was an affluent merchant neighborhood of its time. Um, and we had a music hall upstairs. Uh, my business partner is uh, Corin Capshaw, who's the uh, manager of the Dave Matthews Band, another pretty famous uh, entity from this town. Um, used to play, uh, talk to someone, two to five dollar every Tuesday at Tracks Nightclub during the uh, during the era. Uh, we had a lot of great music. And then in 2007, the last uh, bullet point there, we uh, we moved the brewery out to its current location, which is a little west of Charlottesville and Crozet, and the old uh, frozen food factory called ConAgra. Uh, we do tours out there every weekend, so if you guys are sticking around this weekend, I encourage you to come out uh, about 12 miles west of here. Uh, we have tours uh, on the hour at 1, 2, 3, and 4. You can uh, sample all of our beers, buy a shirt, six-pack, that kind of thing to take home with you. So that's a little bit about uh, who I am and uh, what, what's, what we're about. Um, so you see here kind of uh, from, from uh, prior to 2007, from 99 to 2007, we were more or less a, uh, hello, uh, a brew pub operation, uh, you know, making beer in our storefront, and uh, we, 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 as we grew, we moved the facility, we grew to a very large production facility, and, and you can see the, you know, the growth of, of the brand from 48, 50,000 cases in 2007 to about 336,000 cases estimate for this year. Great growth from, you know, 106 percent, 70, and then in the mid-20s, and, and part of what this, all of this is about is about, you know, and in, in what has been considered or talked about one of the worst economic climates of our lifetimes. Craft beer, microbrewed beers have continued to thrive and continued to grow. Um, this, uh, so I'm going to dive in a little bit to kind of just beer as a category, beer as an overview, <laughs> but, um, and, and what, what, what you know, is going on there. So this is a slide from what's called the IRI scan data. All the grocery stores who scan, you know, every time you scan a six pack or a barcode of any beer that you buy is captured. Um, and you can see up top, this is a total U.S., so this is the entire, uh, entire country. Beer as a category was relatively flat. It was up about a, a little less than a percent. Um, and then if you look below that, the premium beers were down uh, 2%. Uh, craft beer, up 15%. So while beer as a category is pretty flat, craft beer is really what's kind of driving the, uh, the engine of uh, economic growth. And then uh, again, beer is an $8 billion industry. So um, beer is one of the top beverages uh, in the country, is an $8 billion industry. And then you can see kind of how the drug stores did, convenience stores did, and liquor stores did. But beer is a, as a category up about 1%, craft is up 15%, and then Star Hill down here at the bottom, we were up about 40% last year. So that gives you an idea of how beer is doing. Uh, you can see PAB here, those are the flavored malt beverages, the uh, Smirnoff, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, malt liquors speak for themselves. <clears throat> Sub premiums, I mean, and maybe you guys have graduated and so there's 30 cases of Natty Light, you're not buying those as much anymore, so they're down about 3.3%. Um, the next slide is, is Virginia. So we kind of take the uh, you know, 30,000 feet of the U.S. and we drill down just a little bit farther into, uh, into Virginia. You can see in, in Virginia, beers uh, had a little bit, little bit more healthy of a 1.1 uh, growth. And then uh, craft itself is uh, actually more healthy at almost 20% growth. The imports are down a little bit, and um, so are the sub-premiums. But in general, you can see a lot of, a lot of red here where the average consumer, as they come, come of legal drinking age, they're not drinking their dad's beer anymore. They're really, there's a diversification in, in different flavors and styles and products that allow the consumer now to really experiment with uh, a lot of different flavors. Um, and so in Virginia, Star Hill again was up about 30% on a 20% base for craft beer. So craft beer in Virginia is actually growing a little bit faster than the, uh, than the national average. 
Um, so we drill down a little bit more. So the, of the top 15 craft brands in the state of Virginia, you can start at the top and you see Boston Beer, that's your Samuel Adams, they're down a little bit. Sierra Nevada is having a good year. The CBA Craft Brewers Alliance, that's Red Hook, Windmere, and a couple of others, up 6%. Uh, North American Brewers is Magic Hat. New Belgium is Fat Tire. They don't really have a comp number here in Virginia because they just released, uh, if you guys are from Virginia or from the East Coast, you probably have seen with much fanfare, uh, one of the founding pioneer breweries, New Belgium, with their, their main brand, Fat Tire. Um, Star Hill is the sixth largest craft brewery in the state of Virginia. Our sales trends, as you can see, are up 30%. So of the top six, we are the uh, fastest growing uh, craft brewery in the state of Virginia. Some other players you probably have had, there's someone in you know, a Dogfish shirt out there. Uh, Dogfish, uh, Sam Calagione founded that brewery in, uh, in Delaware. Um, makes some amazing beers. Flying Dog is out of Maryland as well. Legends is from Richmond. Um, and then down the list we go. So you can see craft beer as a totality is, having a, is, have, is really having some very successful growth. Um, and specifically, Star Hill at 30% is, is doing very well. So now we look at, uh, we, we drill down from the different breweries and the different brands in Virginia. You can see Sam, uh, Sam Adams uh, Seasonal is the top, uh, Sierra Nevada Pale Ale, a couple more Sam's, New Belgium's Fat Tire. Um, and Star Hill has two of the top 25 uh, brands in the state of Virginia, our Variety 12 pack, and we'll talk more about kind of the different uh, options to the consumer out there, but our Variety uh, 12 pack is a uh, 19% growth, and then our, our number one selling beers is IPA Northern Lights, is up 120% uh, year over year. And we'll talk again more about uh, the styles, India Pale Ales, and uh, variety packs. And then th this gets to that point. So uh, in beer itself, you know, it used to be that, you know, uh, back in when my dad was going to be, beer was what I call the a bomb shelter commodity. It came in a white can, had black letters that said beer on it, and you bought it by the pallet, and you, you stored it in the basement in case Armageddon never happened, and you, you know, just chugged it down. Uh, but those days are kind of behind us now, and there's been a, a proliferation of different styles of beer. Um, and of these styles of beer, you can see, uh, you know, this is 100% of, of the total here, and these are the different styles going down. Craft seasonal is the, uh, is the top style of beer, followed by IPA. Um, and you can see the break, 20% uh, of the percentage of beer sales are seasonals, 13 at the IPA. And obviously the, the, the craft consumer, and, and as does the, the brewmaster, love to introduce new products. I've heard a couple of people comment about our spring seasonal, our Pilsner. Uh, in the fall, you'll see a lot of kind of, uh, you know, Oktoberfest beers, some pumpkin beers. The winter, you'll see some darker stouts and porters and some spiced beers. So, you know, the, the, the brewers love to make beers that are, that are seasonal. Uh, and the consumers are readily uh, are, are, are acknowledging that by what's new and what's different. Uh, craft Pale Ale, the craft variety pack that we talked about. So you get uh, a 12 pack with uh, four different varieties of beer in it. You have amber ales, amber lagers, wheats, box, fruit beers, and other pale ales. So those encompass the kind of top styles of beer out there um, amongst uh, the craft consumer. This chart is, is a little bit busy, but it kind of drills down a little bit on the things that I just said. It kind of has the same information, craft seasonals, 20% IPAs. And then on, on the right-hand side, what I like, you can see kind of where the growth is happening. So although craft seasonal is 20%, it's lost almost a half a percentage point of, uh, of share, while craft IPAs have gained 2.7 uh, percent, uh, percentage points, which really tells me that... Uh, you know, that the consumer is actively engaged in, 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 in this style of beer, the IPA style of beer. It is the biggest, you know, it's the fastest growing, picking up two and almost three uh, points. And then craft variety packs are picking up uh, 1.2 as well. So these two, these two styles of beer, the IPAs and the variety packs, are within craft as, as, as a universe, are really uh, exploding, generating a, a, lot, a lot of new trial adoption and then preference after, after that. The others, uh, the amber ale, amber lager, wheat, box, fruit beers are all down slightly. And then other pale lagers, pretty much flat. Mark, yes, sir. Where box That's a good question. I, 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 would, I would just venture to say that they, their percentages are so low that they're, they're not, they didn't hit the, uh, the top like, chart radar there, would be my, my guess. Um, but Bach, you know, I have an interesting story about Bach. I mean, Bachs are a classic, almost seasonal style of beer. Bach, is, uh, 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 Bach has, uh, the, it, it means the word strength in Germany, Germany or German. And um, the German brewers would brew several different styles of Bach beers as seasonal beers. They would do a pale Bach called a Mai Bach or May Bach for their May Day Festival. They would do a doppel Bach, a, a double strength Bach, and even a triple Bach for the fall and winter. So 
a lot of different cultures have beers that are, that are technically, I guess, seasonals, and they are brewed just kind of on their, uh, the, the rite of passage for that different culture that they came from. Um, and in fact, many styles of beer came, come from the different region or orig origin of the brand comes from the, uh, the region that the beer was brewed. And I think the India Pale Ales, well, I'm going to wait till I get to that, is a great story about how IPAs came about as, as we go through kind of the world of beer. And I encourage you to ask questions. There will, there will be a question and a answer at the end of the, uh, end of the uh, presentation. So this is, our, this is our, 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 uh, our sales sheet or fact sheet. And you can see these are all the beers that Star Hill makes. These first, I guess, six are everyday beers. We make them every day. And these last three are our seasonal beers. So right now, our spring and summer seasonal is a Pilsner beer. It gives way uh, in the fall to a pumpkin porter, which is spiced with a little bit of pumpkin spice. And there's a lot of pumpkin puree. And then we do kind of a higher strength uh, beer called the Gift, which is a uh, pale bock uh, for the wintertime months. As I mentioned, Northern Lights, it's India Pale Ale. It's the, uh, the, the fastest growing and best, the best selling India Pale Ale in the state of Virginia. We make a wheat beer that we call the Love. We have a stout, uh, Dark Star Stout, which is very you know, dark in color, a lot of chocolate and coffee flavors. We have two lagers here, Festi and Jomo. Uh, Festi is kind of an am American amber lager. Jomo is a uh, Vienna style lager. And so a Vienna lager is, uh, is noted by its caramel sweetness. And it came from a certain region of the world in Vienna where they, that was the style of beer that they enjoy. They, they, they made that beer kind of just for themselves. And now fast forward, uh, brewers from across the country make styles of beer called Vienna lagers based on just a natural uh, occurrence um, from, from where they had made the beer. Amber Ale is the first beer we ever made. It's an Irish red ale, so it's kind of malty, it's sweet. Um, and then we also have a beer called Double Platinum, so with a, which is an uh, imperial IPA. So it's, it's, uh, it's a pale ale, with a, it's been dry hopped. It has even more hop aroma, flavor, and bitterness, and it's, it's about 8.5% alcohol. So with the explosion of the India Pale Ales, you're also seeing this kind of hybrid uh, with taking this brand, Northern Lights, and putting it on some steroids to get a beer as, as if, it, if it can be any more bitter than it normally was. That's, uh, that's our double platinum, as I mentioned, our three seasonals there to the right. So yeah, Northern Lights India Pale Ale. Um, you can see here on the, on the product description sheet, uh, it's, uh, it's a two row, these are the different barleys, uh, which is two row pale malt, caramel malt, Munich, and then wheat. Each of these uh, malts give a different flavor. The caramel malt is, is noted for its sweetness. So it, prov it provides a, a little bit of residual sugars that are left over in the beer that make the beer taste a little bit sweet. And then probably the most important thing for this beer are the different hops that we use. So we use Cascade and Golding hops. The Goldings are kind of a classic British or English style hops. And Cascade is, a, is, a, is the quintessential American style hop. Uh, Sierra Nevada Brewing Company, which is you know, more or less invented the American style pale ale, um, and uh, used this hop here, the Cascade hop, which has a very signature grapefruit uh, citrus-like quality to it. Um, partially because they were located near, uh, in near Oregon and uh, where most of the hops are grown in America. Um, that hop was brand new at the time when they launched their brewery and um, it's made their brand you know, very, very uh, uh, unique. The flavor is uh, intense, high, uh, high hop aroma, flavor and bitterness. It's a very hoppy uh, uh, style of beer. This bitterness thing here, and this is as we get into kind of diving into beer and beer uh, geekiness, I guess you might say, is that bitterness is a term for the hops and how, how much dry kind of puckering there is on the tongue. A typical domestic lager, Bud Miller Coors, is about a 14. Um, Sierra Nevada's Pale Ale, which is an American Pale Ale, is probably in the mid-40s. This one's at 52. And then the alcohol percentage is about 6.5%. And this, so this alcohol at 6.5 is about a percent and a half higher than most of the other beers that we make or even uh, as a benchmark using a domestic lager, which is about four and a half. Um, but the style, as I was telling you, this is a very interesting story about how this style came about. So the British brewers were responsible for making the beers for the colonists and the uh, sailors in India. And they would make a beer, a typical beer in the time, and you have to think about there was no refrigeration, um, sanitation was questionable at the time. They would make a normal English-style pale ale. They'd put it in a wooden cask. They'd sail it around the Horn of Africa, and six months later, uh, the beer would spoil and not taste very good. And, and you can imagine if you were a sailor in India and it was 100 degrees and part of your pay was rations of beer, you, you weren't too psyched about your, your, uh, your pay that day. So the British brewers really out of necessity made a beer that was a little bit higher in hops and a higher in, uh, in alcohol. And those two things did uh, you know, miraculous things. The, hops, the hop oils in beer 
um, uh, have an antibacterial effect, just uh, so they help to preserve beer and sanitize beer. And then the ethanol itself, obviously you wash your hair, wipe your hands with a Purell, uh, that sanitizes as well. So the point of the story is that the British brewers, out of necessity, made what, what went on to become the India Pale Ale, a beer that was higher in hops and higher in alcohol. It made the voyage around the Horn of Africa and uh, tasted fresh and everyone rejoiced and the, the British sailors were happy again. Um, so that's Star Hill's India Pale Ale. So this is a, a little bit more of a dive in on our seasonal beers. You can see right now from, uh, from March through July, uh, we have this Pilsner beer. Pilsner beers are, you know, we're kind of in, invented it for, for lack of a better word in Pilsen Czechoslovakia. Uh, they didn't understand uh, at the time, but the water in, in uh, Pilsen Czechoslovakia was very soft and very soft water allowed them to make a very light colored beer. And up until that point, uh, most of the beers were darker in color. Um, they came, the, the water was a lot harder, a lot more calcium and minerals in the water. But uh, Pils and Czechos, the Pilsner beer was born in Pilsner, Czechoslovakia um, because of the fact that they had very soft brewing water. Uh, our fall seasonal, which is August through uh, October, is a pumpkin porter. So it's, uh, you know, the porter is another interesting story. This is kind of a, an American hybrid uh, in the fact that it's, you know, we've added pumpkin, a little bit of pumpkin pie spice uh, in the Whirlpool, the last step that gives it some aroma of, of pumpkin pie. There's a lot of pumpkin puree uh, back in the, you know, back in the early colonial times, uh, you know, people made beer out of anything they could find readily available. The colonists oftentimes made beer with just straight pumpkins. They fermented the sugar in the pumpkins. But the, the point of one of the points of the story, story is, as we talked about the India Pale Ale just a second ago, Porter is a great, uh, another great story. The typical publican uh, in, in, uh, in England at the time had, a, had three different beers that he would serve, a, kind of a light, a medium, and a dark. They were unfiltered, they were in wooden casks, and when the, when the beers got really low in the, in the keg or the cask, they would get really milky and cloudy, they really were not servable uh, or saleable. So the, the, the British barkeep would then blend these three dregs of the, the kegs together, and they would serve them at a lower price to the working class, the porter class of England. And out of that kind of necessity or trying to squeeze as much liquid or profit as you can, the, the publican uh, back in the day created a style of beer out of necessity again where we, we now know it as the porter beer. The beer became very popular in England and the British brewers then started making a beer that was called porter and marketed as porter beer. Um, the stout category uh, actually grew out of porter. So Porters were kind of the first uh, incar incarnation of a darker, sweeter beer. The stouts were actually a, a little bit higher during the time, a higher gravity version of a porter, and, uh, and uh, uh, very often exported or, or made for export. So your stout, meaning a kind of more robust style of beer, kind of sprung out of, out of the porter story. Then we get back to our winter beer from November through February. We have the gift. Uh, our mission or our slogan has always been the gift of great beer. So this beer really reflects that, uh, reflects that mission. This is a pale style of a uh, 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 pale Bach beer. So it's got some Pilsner malt in it, caramel from some sweetness. You can see the hop here. I don't know if you can see it. It's a Hallertauer. It's a German style hop, very German style of beer. A little bit of alcohol warming uh, and a sweet finish, 6.5% uh, uh, alcohol. So those are Star Hill's three seasonal beers, and it gives you kind of a, a play on a little bit of a representation of, of, of three of the multitude of different styles that are out there that Star Hill does every year. These are the variety 12 packs that I was mentioning. So the consumer, and especially with craft and being this proliferation of all these different styles and colors and fancy labels, uh, you know, the consumer, as they, 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 you know, as they go from awareness, they're aware that Star Hill is out there, they're aware of craft beer in general. Then they will do some trial, and hopefully from trial they'll get preference. But this is, in many ways, a trial package. Uh, the consumer can come in. In summer right now, we're doing our summer tour, um, and we do a lot of uh, music themed, music name, summer tour, box set, and headliners. But we've got three different varieties of beer. Our Northern Lights, which is our number one selling beer, the Love, which is our wheat beer, the Pilsner, which is our seasonal, and then Joma. So three kind of lighter bodied beers for the summer. You can purchase this as a consumer, try any one of them, or you can try all four, and then you, you know, hopefully would like one of them and be able to go back to the store uh, and buy an individual six pack of one of those four flavors of beer. Uh, and then in the winter, you can see we change it up a little bit. We have some darker styles as boxcar porter. We have our stout in there. We keep Northern Lights in every single box because and the seasonal to match. But uh, Northern Lights, again, is our, is our best selling beer. But this, is, these, this is an example of a variety 12 pack that you will see at this point, pretty much every craft brewery in Amer America makes something like this. Uh, so if you're from a you know, you know, local area, or, you know, wherever you're living or wherever you're from, you might grab one of these to take up with you when you go visit your relatives or friends or family. 
Um, again, every brewery uh, has a variety 12 pack uh, out there on the street, more or less these days. All right, so what's that? Yeah, so the question is, do we use pumpkin puree uh, and the spices or a combination? And I guess we, the answer to that is yes, we use both. In the, the first part of brewing, it's called the mashing, where you add the water and the barley, ground up barley together to make this porridge, if you will. And in that portion of the brew, the first part, then the mashing part, uh, when we first add the barley and water together, we, we put in a couple hundred pounds of, of pumpkin puree. Um, and that just that steeps in there with the barley and with the grain. And then at the very end of the cooking process, after the steam has been turned off, the beer gets shipped to a vessel that's called the Whirlpool. It kind of gets shipped in and, and centrifugally spins, and a lot of the heavy resins settle out to the bottom to clarify the liquid. So at that last point, the Whirlpool, we then will add a muslin bag filled with cinnamon, nutmeg, allspice, that kind of thing. And that gives it a little bit of that aromatic quality. Um, so as you taste pumpkin beers in general, they range really from just beers that don't have any pumpkin flavor. So if, we, if you just put the pumpkin puree, all that sugar would just be fermented out and you wouldn't ever have a perceivable pumpkin flavor to it. The spices is what, is what kind of fakes you out and gives you this, this notion that there's a little bit of pumpkin pie you know, in, in, the, in the liquid itself. It's a good question. Any other questions at this point? Okay. All right, so we're going to walk through, uh, I guess I would like to call a, a, a revisionist history of beer. The, the craft consumer is now more educated than they ever have been before. They understand extreme beer. They understand what a 13% 200 bitterness unit flavored with cocoa puffs and raspberry juice tastes like. They get it. They understand it. They've had it. But at the same time, beer, because it is the beverage of cultures throughout time, they want to have a liquid that they can you know, watch the presidential debates. They can watch a football game. They want a beverage that they can enjoy the art of, the, of drinking a beer, where they, beer is such a social thing. So the point of that is I see the industry swing. I see it going kind of two ways. It's in, in totality, the beers that keep the lights on, that sell a lot, the alcohol percentages are going to drop, the, uh, the overall intensity, the shock and awe factors are going to come back down. That's, that's the way and one of the reasons we made the Pilsner beer, uh, because I do believe that the, at the end of the day, the consumers really want to enjoy the company of friends, and they want to enjoy that the liquid is a, is a kind of complement to the occasion, not the occasion itself. The other small segment within that, which we're seeing now, is the, uh, the idea of luxury, the idea of, a, of, of, of the super high end. So there's, a, there's, a, there's an explosion as well within craft of this uh, wine bottle format, the big bottle format, the uh, aged and oak, um, something that you would pay, you know, like a high-end bottle of champagne, Dom Perignon, where you would pay a, you know, a fairly high price for a very small amount of liquid, a champagne bottle of beer um, that, you would share, that, you, that you would drink on very limited, very special occasions. So while the, the, in totality I see the industry swinging back to a more moderate alcohol and flavor threshold, there is a lot of growth in that high, super high-end seg segment, but it's not what's keeping the lights on for any brewery out there. It, it builds like a halo effect. Right. Has Starville ever considered um, doing a session beer, which would be under 5%? Well, I, we do, yeah. So the Pilsner's under 5%, our Joma Lager is under 5%, uh, Dark Star Stout, our Dry Irish Stout's 42 we, I'm, very, I'm very much in favor of and, and passionate about session beers and uh, beers that are drinkable, well-made, defined by style um, versus the you know, average. I remember talking to Sam from Dogfish Head Brewery, love him to death. He's created an amazing brand. But he was telling me one day that the average alcohol by volume coming out of his brewery was 9.5%. And that blew my mind. I mean, that's something that I, mean, I don't know what, I know what my liver looks like, but I don't know what his is like uh, at that kind of alcohol strength. So we do make a lot of session beers, and we're very, you know, kind of like happy and proud about those. There have been some brewers that have tried light, making a light beer in the craft category, but the, the, for many reasons, that beer has never sold well. And, the, the, and in my opinion, the, uh, the, the, the light beer drinker is so fixed on. If you become that person and you're drinking Bud Miller Coors light beer, you just psychologically are just, you're, you're not going to be shaken from that tree, regardless of other brands. I mean, um, Sierra, uh, not Sierra, uh, Sam Adams has a light beer, uh, as does Yingling, um, and they do relatively well, but they're, they're, not, they're not setting the world on fire. Uh, and there have been several brewers that have tried it, but none of them have really stuck. Because there's other guys doing that really, really well. And it's kind of find your niche and then do that really well, and, and, and light beers are being done by others. Other questions? Let me uh, dive back into this. 
So the revisionist history of beer by Mark Thompson, you can quote me on all of these things. So according to one prominent anthropologist, what lured our ancient ancestors out of their caves may not have been their thirst for knowledge, but a thirst for beer. Dr. Solomon Katz theorizes that when man learned to ferment grain into beer more than 10,000 years ago, it became one of, uh, one of his most important sources of nutrition. Beer gave people protein that unfermented grains could not supply, and besides, it tasted a whole lot better than unfermented grain did. But in order to have a steady supply of beer, it was necessary to have a steady supply of beer's ingredients. Man had to give up his pneumatic ways, settle down, and begin farming. And once he did, civilization was just a stone's throw away. So if you, if you learn anything today, is that beer is really responsible of why we have civilization uh, today. It, pre, it predates uh, bread, and I, I was, I've always found that to be you know, just something that I can hang my hat on every morning when I get up and go to work. Uh, so that's, uh, that's what that is. So bring a quick overview of, of, of beer itself. You know, beer's been made forever and ever and ever. Predates, predates bread. 4,300 BC, the Babylonians uh, had clay tablets for recipes of how to make beer. they are hieroglyphs on the, uh, on the Egyptian tombs. 1516 is another kind of mile marker where the Rhein-Holzgebot laws in Germany, and the Germans still to this day take their beer making extremely uh, passionately. Um, they made a set of laws uh, that beer could only be made with four ingredients, barley, hops, water, and, uh, and yeast. And uh, anyone who made beer with other ingredients was you know, persecuted for that. 1620, the pilgrims uh, landed on Plymouth Rock. Why? Because they were out of beer. <laughs> like, forget this sailing thing, we're done. There's land, turn the boat around, and we're going and we're landing in Providence Town, Massachusetts. And one of the, the captain wrote about, you know, mutiny on the boat and all of these things. And one of the, the ones that, again, I hung on to is that they were out of beer. So they, they, they parked their boat in Providence Town and, you know, settled America as we know it today. 1786, being from the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, uh, Thomas Jefferson, uh, uh, at the Monticello began to write about his passion for beer and uh, the things that he did to make beer uh, on the Monticello. We're going to come back to this one uh, after this, uh, the history is done because of the, you know, the ties of the, of the university into the, to uh, Charlottesville. Uh, 1800s, uh, big immigration wave. So the German immigrants started moving to uh, the United States. So you had Bush, Miller, Coors, Strohs, and Schlitz, all uh, German immigrants coming to America and bringing with them this passion for beer and uh, began kind of the, if you will, the, the rise of industrialized beer production uh, here in America. Uh, 1876, uh, Louis Pasteur unravels the mystery of beer before Pasteur. Um, you know, beer, uh, the fermentation process was a mystery. Louis Pasteur, we all think of him for what, what scientific invention? Pasteurization. And we all think of that for what food product? Milk. Well, they were pasteurizing beer about 18 years prior to pasteurizing milk. And Pasteur did all of his most famous scientific research in a German brewery, and he was the one that uh, discovered that it was a single-celled organism called a yeast cell that was responsible for converting sugar into ethanol and carbon dioxide, which is what we call beer. Um, 1880, uh, the number of breweries peaked at about 2,300 beer or 2,300 breweries, and then the great experiment. Prohibition. Things come crashing down and, and crashing to an end. Uh, the temperance movement, breweries are forced to go under and, and shut down. Um, we then fast forward to uh, the, the happier part of the story, 1933, Prohibition ends. 1965, uh, Fritz Maytag, uh, heir to the uh, Maytag washer dryer empire, buys an alien regional brewery in San Francisco. And this event has been kind of credited with the beginning of, of craft beer or microbrewing in, in America. Um, 1976, Jimmy Carter legalizes homebrewing for the first time. Up until then, uh, homebrew was still technically illegal in America. 1980, four years later, uh, Ken Grossman uh, founds Sierra Nevada Brewing Company. It's one of the first uh, 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 craft breweries here, here in America. But then even from 1980 and then in 1990, still to, at this point, five breweries that I mentioned controlled 90% of all beer sold in America is controlled by these five breweries. Anheuser-Busch, Miller, Coors, Strohs, and Heilman have 90% of all beer sold in, in, in America. 1999, um, the Star Hill Breweries founded. This number is not correct, but in 2011, there were more breweries for the first time since Prohibition. Uh, and we, you know, so in the sky is the limit. Uh, where it stops is anybody's guess. I mean, there are now again more breweries than there were ever before. There's a lot of consumer demand. But at the same time, uh, there are, I think, there's somewhere in the near 2,000 breweries that are, are, that are open and operating in America right now. There are 1,000 more planned for this year. 
So you know, there's a huge explosion in craft breweries, a number of craft breweries. Where it all, where the merry-go-round merry stops is anybody's guess. Um, so I, then I said I'd come back to this. So Star Hill has been working on, or actually we have a beer that we've done uh, with a lot of work through the universe and, uh, with uh, the Thomas uh, Monticello Foundation, excuse me. So we now have a beer of Monticello Reserve Ale based on, it's got a great story, it's really fuzzy that you can't read, but based on a lot of the things that Jefferson did and wrote about, and he was very passionate about his beer making. Uh, you know, often said that he, he tried to make wine but never did, but was able to make beer. Uh, a couple of quick quotes that, you know, beer, if drank in moderation, softens the temper, cheers the spirit, and promotes health. Another one that uh, is actually on the label here is that I have lately become a brewer for family use, having had the benefit of instruction to one of my people by an Englishman, uh, English brewer of the first order. And this is in, from 1815. So uh, Jefferson planted his first hop garden in 1794, and this is all documented uh, and part of the research that we did to make this beer. Um, was all uncovered in like a lot of these letters, but this uh, Captain Joseph Miller taught uh, the Hemings family, the slave family, how to brew, brew beer in 1812, uh, and then in 1814, Tom Jefferson built a brew house up there for uh, that they were still looking for uh, arche archaeologically. But the unique thing about this is, and Jefferson writes a lot about it. If you're interested in beer, there's a lot of kind of uh, research on the web about this, but. You know, beer can be made, as I mentioned, with pumpkins or any kind of fermentable sugar. Uh, Jefferson wrote uh, that, that he did not think that beer could be made with any recipe, that uh, typically beer is made with barley, uh, but he did not have access to barley, so he, uh, he used wheat and corn, uh, which he had available, and he wrote a lot about how he was unable to find barley, or if he did, the prices were too high. So, so this beer is kind of a, is a, is a wheat and corn beer with no barley in it, which is part of what makes it unique. It's got English... Uh, an English uh, East Kent Golden Hops, which are an English and Wild American uh, cross hop variety, an English ale yeast, um, and it's again uh, we came out with this after about six years of research uh, about a year ago. It's on draft at a few places around town. It also comes in a commemorative uh, 750 bottle. But uh, so Jefferson was very very passionate about beer, and you know even one of them he uh, he, he was obviously as you guys know a huge book collector. He collected books on everything. And one of his letters that I found to be kind of funny is he lent his brewing book, this uh, book by Colmbrheim, to a friend of his. And then uh, his friend never gave the book back. And so he wrote this kind of pissy letter to his friends like, dude, give me my book back. I'm making beer up here on the Monticello. Yes, sir. So in the research of, of a beer like this, how many iterations or trials do we do? Uh, you know, I guess most of this beer was, is, was in, the, in the classroom, in the, uh, in the books and all of that. Once we started the actual process of, of cooking and making it, we did three or four test batches that we, we kind of sat down and tasted. And mainly what we were aiming for is we, we didn't want to make a beer that was historically accurate but tasted not very good. I mean, that doesn't do anyone really any good to make that. I mean, it doesn't do me any good because <laughs> I'm, I'm in the business of s selling beer. I mean, some historical person might, might disagree with me, but... Um, so yeah, it was, it was. So we made it mainly, for the, you know, once we tried several trials, and they all were pretty similar to uh, to uh, to taste. But we made it uh, two or three different batches, and then and then people will, will often ask when you make a new like the Pilsner beer, how do you how does that process work? So sometimes we will have a name and a label picked out for a brand that we really like, and then we'll brew a beer in behind it. Other times we, we, we will do trials and test batches of a beer and then take months to find the name and the imagery that goes with it. So it kind of goes both ways. Um, but typically we'll do uh, like a 15 gallon kind of, you take, we have a keg, a homebrew system you would call it, kegs cut off the top, which we'll do 15 gallons and then we'll scale that up to 150 gallons, then to 300 and then to a normal production batch, which is about 3,000 gallons for us. One forty-three. All right, beers ingredients. This is pretty straightforward, but um, you know you've got water, and water obviously is a huge, uh, very important factor in beer. As I mentioned, the Pilsen story about Pilsen uh, water being, being very soft. Uh, you know, ninety-three to ninety-five percent of beer is water, so your water source really does matter. The minerals in that water, the hardness of that water, how much calcium and sulfate, and the chemistry of the water. You know, but that being said, today uh, we can, we can get as brewers we get water analysis, and we can then mimic waters from around the world, which we often do. So we will filter our water, and then we will then add different minerals or chemicals back. So when we make uh, an India Pale Ale, which has got a certain water profile, we'll uh, you know we'll change the water chemistry versus a Pilsner beer, which has a lighter profile, where uh, we'll keep the water a little bit different. So that first ingredient, pretty self-explanatory. Barley, you know, if you've never seen the, the great you know, the plains of Kansas and the Dakotas of barley, it's a little plant about like, you know, yay tall, 
Um, they take the barley and um, it is, it's grown in the, in the Dakotas and through southern Canada, and then it goes through a process called malting, and malting is where we get our sugar, so is where the sugar and the grain comes from. What they'll do is they'll harvest that barley, they'll put it in a big a silo uh, out, you know, outside, and that seed will overwinter in that silo. The following spring, they will then take the seed out of the silo to a malting facility, and the seed uh, has stored all of its energies, long chains of sugars called carbohydrates, and when they take the seed to the malting uh, plant, they soak it in a large swimming pool. The seed literally grows a root hair where it begins to metabolize its, its long uh, 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 carbohydrates into simple sugars. They, they then drain the swimming pool and then they take it to a roasting house like you have for coffee. So they'll roast the grain either, you know, kind of lightly for a, like a Maxwell House roast or very dark for a, a, a Starbucks espresso roast. So depending on the roast of the, uh, of the barley that we get, so we'll have uh, some barley, one, one variety is called chocolate malt. It's as black as night and it has a lot of chocolate and coffee flavors. The Pilsner malt, very light in color. And then we will then blend all these different types of barley together um, to, make a, uh, to make a recipe uh, for whatever style of beer that we're trying to make. But the point, I guess, some of that is that the, these barley, the, you know, the, the Pilsner malt and the, and the chocolate malt could have been grown in the same field. A lot of it has to do with just the, how the, that uh, grain is roasted. The hops, uh, you know, this is what a, a whole flower hops look like. Um, you can see in here these little uh, glands of yellow resin. This is really what, uh, what gives hops the bang for its buck. And um, it's the oils in the hops. They're in the same families of a lot of your basil and cooking herbs. It's the oil in there. This is what, really what the brewers are driving for when they use hops. You know, and hops are an interest, in an in, very interesting plant. And before hops, uh, brewers across, uh, you know, across the world would use anything they, they had locally available to them to spice their beer. So some brewers would use sassafras roots or uh, spruce tips or heather flowers. The Danish culture had this local plant called the hop plant that they used. And their beer, for some reason, tasted better and lasted longer. We talked briefly about how the oils in this plant have an antibacterial effect. But probably more importantly, they, uh, these oils give us the B word for beer. Anyone know what that is? Bitter. And uh, so unlike that, that Keystone Light bitter beer face uh, uh, from back in the day, bitterness is a very important component of beer and, and why today, if you fast forward, uh, in order for me to call something beer, it has to have the spice of the hop plant in it. Without bitterness, beer would be this multi-sweet tonic. It'd be this barley juice tonic. That sweetness is balanced by the bitterness. So that, that is the importance of the bitterness of beer balances the malt sweetness to where, you know, that's why, you know, beer is, is the most preferred uh, adult beverage uh, uh, today is, is because the beer is balanced with this ingredient here, uh, hops. These hops are uh, oftentimes ground up and put into little pellets if you ever go into a brewery and see. They almost look like rabbit food. But that, so that's the hop plant. Most of these, yes, question. Well, so the question is, how, how is the hop supply in America today? Absolutely, several years ago, I think maybe five years ago, there was a global hop shortage. Um, and part of that stemmed from there was a, the largest producer of hops in the Pacific Northwest had an, basically that their, almost their entire year crop burn uh, up in their warehouse. So their warehouse burnt to the ground. You couple that with, uh, with a, you know, uh, a drought in, in England. I'm going to make that up. But so all of these ingredients are commodity markets. It's, it's, it's very similar to the price of gasoline or, you know, why, did, why has gas gone from almost $4, almost $3 in a matter of, of a blink of an eye? Fast forward to the day that the hop production is, uh, is, uh, is, is where it needs to be. The hop prices have stabilized. But, yeah, a typical pound of hop uh, during that shortage went from $3 to $23 per pound. Um, based on speculation and based on the global demand um, for the different uh, the usages. The other, the other thing that's, very, that's happening in the hop world is that, is, is, is that monoculture thing, where if you are a farmer of any commodity market, you, you kind of want to just grow one variety and grow the heck out of it and grow bushels and bushels and bushels. Well, the American craft brewer, we like to make six or seven different styles of beer, and each style needs a little bit of each variety of hop. I need some hops from Germany, I need some England from, from America. So there is still a, uh, a shortage, if you will, of what, what's called aroma variety hops. Uh, plenty of uh, bittering hops, but the aroma varieties um, are still in, in kind of short supply and have a tendency to fluctuate on the open market. Other questions? Uh, this is our friend, the yeast. Um, I go to a 215, is that right? Yeah, um, do you want to talk about 10 minutes? Okay.
Sure. I'm almost done, I swear. You, is this a hint? <laughs> I'm starting to get all pacey mouth or something. <laughs> Thank you very much. So yeast, are, are our favorite friend that we talk about, Louis Pasteur, this is under a microscope. You can see little uh, sister cells here. And, and, you know, so that's the that's brand new budding yeast cell. That's the healthy adult cell. Um, in many ways, uh, just like that Dunkin' Donuts commercial time to make the donuts, uh, brewers, all we do is feed our yeast. We wake up every morning, we make them a fresh sugar solution, and we feed it to our yeast, and the yeast is what's responsible for the magic of beer. They take uh, the maltose, the two-carbon sugar maltose, and they convert that into ethanol and carbon dioxide. Um, and also during the pathway of that conversion, it's called the glycolytic pathway, lots of the kind of off flavors or, or, or secondary flavors that you get in beer come from that process. So if you taste a beer that might not taste quite right, or it might have a flavor like in, in the wheat beers, the German style Hefeweizens have a banana and clove kind of flavor to them. That's a good thing, and that occurs during the fermentation process. So yeast, again, uh, you know, is our friend, and if treated properly, uh, are really what's responsible for the magic of beer. So in evaluating flavors, again, uh, I'm going to go through this. You want to look at three important things, the appearance of the beer, uh, the aroma, and the taste of the beer. Uh, and, and while looking at the appearance, you want to look at the color, the clarity and the head retention. And all three of those things are very important. Uh, head retention is the, the white foam that's on top of beer. And that uh, tells you a lot about the health of a beer. It has a certain amount of protein in the beer, uh, will cling to the sides of the glass. It's called Brussels lace. And it's a pretty important uh, component of beer. Um, so that's a, just a, a quick shot of from a you know, fairly light colored beer all the way down to some dark colored beers, and beers as we all kind of know, ranging color and clarity. You know, look at the head on that beer, it's very thick and kind of clinging to the edge of the glass. This one's kind of collapsed uh, on the side of the glass. Um, so that gives you an idea or interpretation of the uh, appearance. The aroma is pretty important, and, like, and I often will ask a question, which is more important, your tongue or your nose in, in drinking beer as far as flavor goes, and, and it's your nose. Your nose can identify over 300 flavors, and your tongue only four. So this is what's called the beer flavor wheel. It was developed by the Association of Brewing Chemists, and you can look, the inner circle here is all, it's called odor, but two-thirds of beer flavor is in the aroma of beer. So you've got a whole family of sulfur compounds that go from cooked vegetables to struck match to sulfur skunky to vegetable oil. And <laughs> who would have ever thought there's, there's a cat one in here too. The oil, uh, oils in the hops have, uh, hop oils have a compound called myrcene. And if you've ever smelled an overflowing cat litter box, and that smell, that's, a lot of that smell is myrcene that you smell. So if you ever get a really, really hoppy beer that hasn't been treated pretty well, you might taste or might remind you of a cat litter box. And I'm, I'm dead on true about that. I've written that as a comment on a judging sheet. So that's the flavor wheel of beer. Two thirds uh, are, are the aroma. And then over here in the flavors, you can see sweet, salt, bitter, uh, and sour. And uh, I've got a picture of the tongue here. So your tongue can only, uh, only perceive these four compounds, bitter on the back of your tongue. So those bumps in the back of your tongue is uh, where you perceive bitterness. And you know, one of the reasons why beer is much superior to wine because you can taste wine and spit it into a bucket, but you can't taste beer unless you actually swallow it. So you learn another thing today. So the bitterness is in the back of the tongue. You got sweet and sour. That was a little late in laugh there. The delivery on that one could have been a little better, I think. But you got sweet and sour on the side, I mean, excuse me, sour and salt on the sides and then sweet on the top. But your tongue will only ever perceive those four uh, flavors, um, you know, and, and, your, and your tongue and your nose a lot more. So I think that's the last slide. And questions and answers. Um, what kind of questions do we have? Yes, ma'am. Oh, I was uh, just asking, do you do focus groups after you go through the process of branding and you know the product and all of that to sure. see if you're going to release it? Absolutely. Um, so the question is, do we do focus groups around the new beers we, we, we release? I guess. Informally, yes, but not a formal uh, uh, focus group. We have a taste, our tasting room is right there. So we get the, we can engage our consumer directly at the brewery. And when we introduce a new beer, oftentimes we put it in our tasting room first and we'd get an informal gauge of, of their reaction. And the other thing that we do is we, we oftentimes will release a new beer as a seasonal beer. I use the uh, sports analogy again. It's kind of like the junior varsity trying to make varsity. So we'll introduce it as a junior varsity player that we know it's only going to be available, let's say, from January through July, and then it's going to go away. So we can, we can gauge how well it does uh, based on the sales. And if it does really well, um, we'll introduce it a year later as a full year beer. 
So that's kind of how we do it. We don't, but we do not have like the little one-way mirror and, and, uh, and that kind of thing. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about the distribution channels for, for microbreweries like yourself? Absolutely. So the, dist the, the distribution uh, channels, the question, and that is one of the, you know, one of the, one of the probably maj major challenges to any small craft brewery is that we are in a, what's called the three-tiered system. Like m uh, most commerce in America is what I call the widget to Walmart thing. If I made a widget and you owned a Walmart, I would sell you my product directly. Alcoholic beverages, uh, one of the laws after prohibition was that you, uh, I have to sell to a wholesaler. So there's another level that I, I, I make the beer and I sell it to a, a, a wholesaler. The wholesaler then sells it to all the retailers, the Kroger's, the Walmart's of the world. And so in addition to, um, I lose a little of profit margin off of that. Um, and it was created for, in my opinion, good uh, purposes to protect the taxes that I pay. I pay a lot of excise taxes that the government thought, well, if we create this middle tier, it will stop maybe some shady, grady business going on that uh, between me as a producer and the uh, person selling the beer. So I'm able to get you know, dis distribution uh, through, uh, through opening up different wholesalers. And you know, most often I, I will meet with a Miller wholesaler, a Coors wholesaler. We talk about our brand, how they think they can do with it. And, um, you know, we'll start selling beer to the wholesaler, then the wholesaler will then deliver it. It has its pros and cons. What will we see in the future from Star Hill? What will we see in the future for, for Star Hill? I mean, Star Hill's vision statement is to become the East Coast, uh, you know, most respected and sought after brewery. So I, we, we hope to uh, have our beer available through distribution uh, throughout the East Coast in the next, you know, five to six years. We're looking at the Northeast right now. Currently, we're available from uh, Maryland through the Carolinas. Um, we're looking to open up some of the Northeast markets, Philly, uh, a little bit of Jersey, and some, uh, some of New York as well. Yeah, we got to open a uh, beer taster at the brewery. Yeah, it's the best job ever, right? Yeah, we're looking for those every day. Yes. Okay. Uh, what background are you looking for in people to come work for you? It's a good question. I, so I think somebody breaking into who wants to go to work for a craft brewery. What training? What kind of knowledge do they need aside from liking to drink it? So what <laughs> what kind of training do they need? A um, couple thoughts there is one is like and it, it goes to the question of how much how many more brewers can there be and how much larger can we get? I want to start with that and then I'll talk about the specific qualifications. But one of the challenges that I really see in the microbrewing and craft brewing industries, and I use the, uh, the, 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 the German supply line analogy, the Germans may have won the World War II if they could have gotten if they could have manned their supply lines, gotten gas to the front lines. Uh, I think I think personally the craft brewery is in, in a challenging position because it's not as if you know like other professions in, in the world lawyers and doctors and nurses we've got four-year degree schools you know churning out this 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 base of people to work for breweries currently there's there are not a lot of new brewing schools or tank makers or things uh, for that we need to continue to grow specifically uh, there are three uh, Oregon State has a very good brewing school four-year degree as does uh, University of California Davis has a four-year brewing degree um, Siebel Institute out of Chicago is, is another one there's a Brewers Guild uh, uh, going on in Vermont right now. So oftentimes what, what I look for is a combination of, uh, of, um, of, of, of someone who's worked at a brewery, one. So it's kind of, an, it's still mainly, I guess, an apprenticed art, an art that, I, that you've worked somewhere else. Having a four-year degree never hurts, um, but a lot of it's just kind of boots on the ground apprenticeship that is what we look for. Yeah, chemistry, engineering is very important. Um, um, I'd say any of your kind of biological science uh, are important. Other questions? Yes. Do you, do you have a strong trade organization that's sort of helping monitor where this is going? You said there's a thousand new breweries and there's always that fear of cannibalizing or maybe having too many at some time. Do you have an organization that's sort of studying where this is going to head? Yeah, so the organizational component, we have a, a, a national organization called the Brewers Association. They're based out of Boulder, Colorado, uh, that do a lot of kind of the uh, national uh, uh, numbers and figures and, and growth rates. And then internally, uh, we've just kind of gotten a, a craft brewers guild from the state. Uh, so the, Virginia now has a guild, members of a lot of the participating brewers. And, and very often, because of the, because of, uh, forgot what amendment that is, but right after prohibition, the states control all alcohol laws. So most of the battle, if you will, are fought state by state. And that's to your distribution question. Like one of the hardest challenges about beer is that 
every state's different. Like, I, I, I can't do certain things. You know, and Virginia is a great one because we're a tobacco state, right? So I, if you walk in a convenience store, you have a tobacco neon right in your face. You've got discounted cigarettes. But in beer, I can't put a neon up in that window front, and I can't discount my product uh, like, the, like they do there. But if I go to North Carolina, it's completely opposite. So it's state by state, and every state's different. And um, I guess that's the answer to that one. Uh, yes, ma'am. So yeah, so, so the question is about you know, cannibalizing other, other talent, and it, it goes on in every industry, I imagine. Um, so you see some of that, and what, what you see a little bit of is that the, the, young, the young guy comes into the brewery after four month internship, works at my brewery for six months, and he thinks he's ready to start his own brewery, and he flies the coop to some new upstart brewery. So there are so many breweries over that you see some of that. But the one that, I, that I've really enjoyed is with the, as the large domestic brewers, um, it, you know, I hate to even like use names, but the, so there's a lot of good talent out there. There's a Anderson Bush Brewery in, in Williamsburg, and we now have their senior plant manager working for us uh, as they kind of pare down their, uh, you know, what they're doing. There's a lot of uh, very well, uh, you know, a lot of, lot of big time brewers who work from large domestic brewers available for us to hire, which is a, a great thing for craft and the talent level. Yes, ma'am. I okay. graduated 20 years ago, and it's just, it's just grown so up. The, yeah, the, but I live in Northern California where it's long established, so what's, what's your perspective? So the, the question is about the, the craft brewing culture here in Virginia, and I, a couple different things. And coming from your perspective of California, you know, in California, in the Pacific Northwest, craft beer has a 30 market share, so three out of every 10 beers sold is, uh, you know, is, is a craft beer versus the national average of five. So the north, or the, where, you, where you live is very mature and very developed. Here specifically in Virginia, which is awesome, is I, and I, I attribute a lot of it to the Virginia wineries. So we, in the craft beer scene here in Virginia in the last three to five years has exploded. We have a brew, what's called the Brewage Trail out where we are, where there are four other breweries around us, as you can make a whole afternoon, and, and they're intermingled with a bunch of wineries. So I really feel here in Virginia that the, that the hard work and the heavy lifting that the uh, wineries have done have really helped open the, uh, the doors for what we're doing now. And you have really seen an explosion in the last three years, five years of craft beers in Virginia, and specifically here around Charlottesville. And I think part of that could be, too, that Charlottesville's, uh, you know, the university brings in a lot of uh, diversification uh, of different people coming to town. I mean, I'd like to see us, uh, we think we can get to 10% as a national average. So we're at five now. We think we've got, you know, 20 more years. I think I, in my lifetime, I'll, we'll continue to see craft beer grow and prosper. Uh, again, as the, the consumer now has shown that they, they, they value the diversification. They, they like the different styles of beer. And I don't think we're going back. Um, address and happy hour starts. <laughs> yeah, so we're, uh, we're at 539. We're on the web. Uh, what, Crozet, uh, wet, 10, 12 miles west of town. We're open from noon to 5, uh, both Saturday and Sunday, with tours on the hour 1, 2, 3, and 4. So if you have a chance, you come in. It's free. To, free. It's open to the public. We do the tours. last about 30, 40 minutes. You can sample six different beers, um, buy a six-pack, a shirt to go. So come on out and see us this weekend for sure. Question. Yeah, so the Monticello Reserve is available. Uh, I, I, I'm, the Kroger in uh, down, I, yeah, it should be in all of, like the Kroger Harris Teeters in the Barracks Rose store. I'm, I'm pretty sure recently I saw a pretty uh, a display of Monticello at the Kroger Barracks Road store, but it should be in, in all of the major groceries around the, the you know the downtown area. Correct. So Festi and Jomo are both lagers. They're both made with the same yeast. Uh, uh, the, the Jomo is slightly sweeter. It's a Vienna style. They're very similar in general. So they're both kind of amber lagers. Uh, the Festi is an Oktoberfest, uh, Martzen style. So it's a little bit more Munich malt, a little drier, a little crisper, uh, where the uh, Jomo is, is, is more uh, caramel malt, more sweetness on the finish, but, but still very similar beers. Yes, sir. Yep, I mean, and that makes sense. I often will use the kind of the common is about water in general. So, I mean, fermented cereal grain beverages, wine, beer, ciders, uh, uh, even vinegar to a certain extent uh, are, are safe for you uh, versus water still to this day. Un, you know, unclean water kills millions of people every year. Um, and I, I jokingly will say at times about being a beer guy, one of the coolest things about being a brewer is there is no known bacteria that grows in beer that will kill you. Think about that for a sec. I mean, no, it used to just be hamburger, and then it was spinach and peanut butter, and like now there was there. The worst thing a brewer can do is make a beer, and the reason a lot of cultures drink fermented things like beer is because it is safe to drink. But the worst thing that any brewer could do is maybe give you some, an upset stomach or something like that. But there's no bacteria that grows in beer that will kill you. That's a good thing. <laughs>
couple more questions. Yes, sir. There is. So cider, among, in, in the universe of, of beer or alcoholic beverage, cider is, it's still a small base, and that's part of why it looks to be growing so quickly. But uh, there's a new cidery here in, uh, right out where we are called Bold Rock Cidery that just opened up. In fact, there are three hard cider uh, places here in central Virginia that have opened up in the last couple of years. Um, cider's growing, um, but it's still on a very small base, and it's yet to be determined, in my opinion, whether the American consumer is going to adopt it again as they have in the past. Question. Yeah, yes, I, I think uh, craft distillation will be the next trend. So 10 years from now, after you, probably 10 years ago, the winery guy came in and talked to you guys. Now I'm here. <laughs> 10 years from now, you're going to be talking to the distilled spirits person. Absolutely, uh, small craft distillation is going to be uh, uh, up and... You know, I, I was for the, for the longest time, and I actually helped a guy in West Virginia open up a distillery, and after seeing just, I, I mean, after seeing it, I know that I can make it, but I'm just not a big fan of, of, of distilled spirits. So my heart just wasn't in it. Uh, so, no, at one point I was, but no. I'm, I'm going to, cheese is the next one. Uh, gourmet cheese, uh, yeah, that's, that's the one I'm really interested in right now. Fer fermenting milk, who would have thought? You could ferment milk and it's called cheese. Yeah, I love that idea, All right. <laughs> I know I'm good at the fermentation thing. <laughs> Other questions? A couple more. Yes, sir. What's your theory on why people still drink Miller Lite? So what's my theory on why people still <laughs> Oh, you're going to get, it's late in the show. I'll start bashing on the big guys and I'll run out. I'll go, look, a squirrel. And you guys all look that way and I'll run out the door. You know, a lot of it's marketing. Beer and spirits and uh, alcoholic beverages are one of the highest marketed products in, in, in the world. I think a lot of it's marketing. I think uh, I think, but in the in the the liquid itself is 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 you know it's not it's not that it's not supposedly right and and less and less filling right. <laughs> I guess I always like the joke uh, the, the joke or have, why is that why is Miller like just like uh, having sex in a canoe? You ever heard that one? They're both they're both effing close to water. <laughs> lot of big. Thank you guys very much for coming out today. I really do appreciate it. You all have a great rest of your uh, your week here. Thank you very much.